I spent a week with my grandchildren and their mother. And what a joy. Could two people be more different? He is looked up to, she is looked down on. He is a church leader, she is a streetwalker. He makes a living promoting standards, and she makes her living breaking them. He's hosting a party. She's crashing it. Ask the other residents of Capernaum to point out the more pious of the two, and they'll pick Simon. Why, after all, he's a student of theology, a man of the cloth. Anyone would pick him, anyone, anyone except Jesus. Jesus knew them both, and Jesus would pick the woman. Jesus does pick the woman. And what's more, he tells Simon why. Not that Simon wants to know his mind is elsewhere. How did this whore get into my house? He doesn't know whom to yell at first, the woman or the servant who let him in let her in. After all, this dinner was a very formal affair. Invitation only. Upper crust. Who let the riffraff in? Simon is angry. Just look at her graveling at Jesus' feet, kissing them no less. Why? If Jesus was who he says he is, he would have nothing to do with this woman. One of the lessons Simon learned that day was this. Don't think thoughts you don't want Jesus to hear. For Jesus heard them, and when he did, he chose to share a few of his own. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. All right, teacher, Simon replied, go ahead. Then Jesus told him this story. There was a man who loaned money to two people. Five pieces of silver to one, and 50 pieces of silver to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave, they gave them both. Canceling, concealing their thoughts, who do you suppose loved him more after that. Simon answered, mm, I suppose the one who he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. That's right. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman. 
kneeling here, and when I entered your home, you didn't even offer me water to wash the dust off my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss of greeting, but she has kissed my feet again and again and again. And from, time, from that time, I first came in. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Luke 7, 40 to 45. Simon invites Jesus to the house that treats him like an unwanted step-uncle. No customary courtesies, no kiss of greeting, no washing his feet, no olive oil for his head. Or, in modern terms, no one opened the door for him, took his coat, or shook his hand. Simon does nothing to make Jesus feel welcome. The woman, however, does everything that Simon didn't. We aren't told her name, just her reputation. A sinner. A prostitute, most likely. She has no invitation to the party and no standing in the community. Imagine a hooker in a tight dress showing up at the parsonage during the pastor's Christmas party. Heads would turn, faces would blush. But people's opinion didn't stop her from coming. It's not for them she has come. It's for him, Jesus. Her every move is measured and meaningful, each gesture extravagant. She puts her cheek to his feet, still dusty from the path, and she has no water, but she has tears. She has no towel, but she has her hair. She uses both to bathe the feet of Christ. As one translation has put it, she rained tears on his feet. She opens a vial of perf perfume and perhaps the only possession of wealth in, uh, that she had. The arona is inescapable as the irony. You'd think Simon, of all people, would show such love. Is he not the reverent of the church? The student of the scripture? But he is harsh, distant. You'd think the woman would avoid Jesus. Is she not the woman of the night, the town hussy? But she can't resist him. Simon's love is calibrated and stingy. His love, on the other hand, her love, on the other hand, is extravagant and risky. How do we explain the difference between the two? Education, training, money. No, for Simon, 
has outdistanced her in all three. But there is one area in which the woman leaves him eating dust. Think about it. What one discovery has she made that Simon hasn't? What one treasure does she cherish that Simon doesn't? Simple. God's love. We don't know when she received it. We aren't told how she heard about it. Did she overhear Jesus' words? Um, Your father is merciful. Was she nearby? Was she nearby when Jesus had compassion on the widow of Nain? Did someone tell her how Jesus touched the lepers and turned the tax collectors into disciples? We don't know. But we know this, she came thirsty. Thirsty from guilt. Thirsty from regret. Thirsty from the countless nights of making love and finding none. She came thirsty. And when Jesus hands her the goblet of grace she drinks, she doesn't just taste or nip. She doesn't dip her finger in and lick it or take the cup and sip it. She lifts the liquid to her lips and drinks, gulping and swallowing like the parched pilgrim she is. She drinks until mercy flows down her chin into her neck and chest. She drinks until every inch of her soul is moist and soft. She comes thirsty and she drinks. She drinks deeply. Simon, on the other hand, doesn't even, doesn't even know he's thirsty. People like Simon don't need grace. They analyze it. They don't request mercy. They debate and prorate it. It wasn't that Simon couldn't be forgiven. He just never asks to be. So while she drinks up, Simon puffs up. While she has ample love to give, she has no love to offer. He has no love to offer. Why? The 747 principle. Read again verse 47 in chapter 7 of chapter 7. The person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Just like the jumbo jet, the 747 principle has wide wings. Just like the aircraft, this truth can lift you to another level. Read it one more time. A person who, has forgive, has, who is forgiven little shows only little love. In other words, we can't give what we have never received. If we never received love, how can we love others? But, oh, how we try. As we can conjure up love by the sheer force of will, as if there is within us a distillery of affection and that lacks only a piece of wood or, or a hotter fire, we poke it and we stroke it with resolve. What's our typical strategy for treating a troubled relationship? 
I don't know how, but I'm going to give it a try. I don't care how much it hurts, I'm going to be nice to the bum. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Okay, I will. So we try. Teeth clenched, jaw firm. We're going to love if it kills us. And it may do just that. Could it be we are missing a step? Could it be that the first step of love is not towards them, but towards him? Could it be that the secret to loving is receiving? You give love by first receiving it. We love because he first loved us. Long to be more loving. Begin by accepting your place as the dearly loved child. Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us. You'll find that in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Finding it hard to put others first. Think of the way Christ put you first. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Need more patience? I've had to ask myself that question. Drink from the patience of God. Is generosity a elusive virtue? Then consider how generous God has been with you. Having trouble putting up with the ungrateful relatives or cranky neighbors. That brings me to this last week. I stayed with uh, my son-in-law's sister and her family. And I have never been in a home that gave more love. A family, and no, they're not Seventh-day Adventists, but they are wonderful and consecrated Christian people. God puts up with you when you act the same. He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. You'll read that in Luke 6.35. Not without God's help. We can't. Oh, we may succeed for a time, and we, like Simon, may open a door, but our relationships need more than a social gesture. Some of our spouses need a foot washing. A few of our friends need a flood of tears. Our children need to be covered in the oil of our love. But if we haven't received these things ourselves, how can we give them to others? Apart from God, Jeremiah 17.9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. A marriage saving love is not within us. A friendship-preserving devotion cannot be found in our hearts. We need help from an outside source. A transfusion, would we, would we love as God loves? Then we start by receiving God's love. 
we have been guilty of skipping the first step. Love each other. Be patient. Be kind. Forgiving. We urge. But instructing people to love without telling them they are loved is like telling them to write a check without making a deposit in their account. No wonder so many relationship are over, relationships are overdrawn. Hearts have insufficient love. The Gospel John tells us the right sequence. He makes a deposit for he tells us to write the check. First, the, the deposit. God showed how much he loved us by sending his son into a world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. It is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And then having made such an outrageous eye-opening deposit, John calls us, and me, calls you and me to pull out the checkbook. Friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. The secret to loving is giving love. This is the forgotten first step in relationship. Remember Paul's prayer? May your roots go deep, down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. Ephesians 3.17 <coughs> As a tree draws nutrients from the soil, we draw nutrients from the Father. But what if the tree has no contact with the soil? <coughs> Does bumping into certain people leave you brittle, breakable, fruitless? Do you easily fall apart? If so, your love may be grounded in the wrong soil. It may be rooted in it may be rooted in their love which is fickle or in your resolve to love which is frail. John urges us to rely on the love God has for us. He alone is the power source. Many people tell us to love. Only God gives us the power to do so. We know what God wants us to do. This is what God commands, that we love each other. But how can we? How can we be kind to the, to the vow breakers, to those who are unkind to us? How can we be patient with the people who have the warmth of a virtue, virtue and the tenderness of a porcupine? How can we forgive the money grubbers and the backstabbers we meet. Love and Mary, how can we love as God loves? We want to, we long to, but how can we? By living loved, by following the 747 principle, receive first, love second. 
want to give it a try? Let's carry this principle up to up the Mount Everest of love writings more than one person has hailed. 1 Corinthians 13, as the finest chapter in the Bible, and no words, no words can get to the heart of loving people like these verses, and no verses get to the heart of the chapter like verses four through eight. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Love never fails. Several years ago, I was challenged to the word love in this passage with my name. I did not become a liar. Cal is patient. Cal is kind. Cal does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. That's enough. Just stop right there. Those words are false. Cal is not patient. Cal is not kind. You might ask my wife. Cal can be an out and outright clod. That's my problem. And for years that was my problem with this paragraph. It is a, it is set a standard I, I could not meet. No one else can meet it. No one. That is except Christ. Does this passage not describe the measureless love of God? Let's insert Christ's name in place of the world love and see if it rings true. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. Jesus is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no records of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in the evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Jesus never fails. Rather than let this scripture remind us of the love we cannot produce, let it remind us of a life, love we cannot resist, God's love. Some of you are so thirsty for this type of love. Those who should, those who should have loved, you didn't. Those who could have loved you, didn't. You were left at the hospital, left at the altar, left at the empty bed, left with a broken heart, left with your question, does anybody love me? Please listen to heaven's answer. 
God loves you personally, powerfully, passionately. Others have promised and failed, but God has promised and succeeded. He loves you with an unfailing love. And his love, if you will let it, can fill you and leave you with a love worth giving. So come. Come thirsty and drink deeply. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love and your trust and your wanting us to love you as you have loved us. So be with us and guide us and keep us in your caring love for eternity, we pray. Amen.